Hello everyone and welcome to episode 352 of the MTG Goldfish Podcast. I'm Seth, probably better known as Seth Fred Olive, and we have the full crew here this week kicking things off with the owner of MTG Goldfish, Richard. What's going on today, Richard? Hey Seth, I, I survived the weekend. It was a <laughs> huge storm uh, in my area. I have a lot of water dripping everywhere, but uh, here I am. <laughs> Internet is back. Our... <laughs> Are the are the playmats on the wall safe? I think that's a question everyone is asking. <laughs> it is very. The garage is fine. The garage is fine. Your playmats will not okay. be soggy. My, you know what? My office is leaking, but a part that you can't see. So the playmat wall is fine. <laughs> oh, good. Well, as long as the playmats are okay, I'm sure you can figure out the rest of that stuff. Uh, but I'm glad. I'm glad you're uh, you're over the the storm and the internet's back. That sounds like a pretty crazy storm. Uh, anyway, we got another co-host in Krim. What's up with you, Krim? Did you also get hit by the storm? You're kind of close to Richard, right? Yeah, I was hit by the storm, but nowhere near the levels that uh, like Richard's area was. Like, legitimately, part of it's like flooded. And like like closer to Richard, whereas over here, I had some Internet outages. Uh, there's a lot of rain uh, and still not enough to really help with the California drought, but there's still a lot of rain. And uh, yeah, like that. Other than that, though, I mean, I think it's it's a little weird. Like, I, I don't think Californians are ready for like or are used to rain. Because, like, once things rain, things get real weird out here. <laughs> if, it, if it rains, like, one inch, all the roads are flooded. <laughs> yeah, like, there's, like, no drainage here. It's, like, oh, terrible. <laughs> we can't get lots of rain at once. We cannot take it. Yeah, and, and like, that's the main thing. And so, like, and when and when that happens, like, the, like, everybody, like, doesn't drive or, you know, like, pretty much over here, we, we do not handle rain. <laughs> <laughs> interesting i didn't realize do you guys just like never get rain there then is it like that infrequent that then just no one's prepared for it yeah like, we don't get it, storms it is we get like drizzles of rain during rainy season but i mean it is you know it's it like is dry mist, we are <laughs> right? you know, it is a drought <laughs> <laughs> yeah whereas over here if we see rain it's just like oh oh boy all right time to close everything down Ah, well, I was I was going to complain about losing internet this weekend because because uh, bear chew through my internet cord and that was an adventure. But I feel like I got off easy compared to uh, you guys. There was no big storm or anything like that. So, so anyway, uh, today for our cast we have a couple of random topics. We got a new card from the Stranger Things secret layer drop, a secret card that wasn't announced with the rest of the spoilers. We got some news about the old Walking Dead secret layer drop, a new design team happening at Wizards, and then we want to talk a bit about modern today. We've talked a lot about standard and historic recently but i want to talk about modern and what modern looks like in a world of modern horizons too it's been a little while since the set release we've kind of know what the metagame looks like now what cards are good and uh, the sets had a huge impact on the format so we want to talk about that and then answer your fish mail questions so that is the overview for today before we get into it though a reminder that our show today is brought to you by Card Conduit. And Card Conduit, you've probably heard about them uh, from us before. They're a great way to sell your magic collection, and they are offering a new service that's geared towards <clears throat> geared towards selling smaller batches of valuable cards with reduced service fees. And as with all of their services, this curated shipment service, you don't need to sort your cards or grade your cards. None of those hassles. You can just safely package them up and ship them out. And of course, you get a detailed report with the results, and you can check out Card Conduit's curated shipment option is a way to buy a list up to 150 cards with fast processing and optimized prices and for the month of October you can even check it out for free by heading over to cardconduit.com slash goldfish and using the code scoops card conduit they're the easiest way to sell your magic cards so thank you so much to card conduit for supporting the show and let's talk some magic let's start with our surprise stranger things card we got one more card and I think it's actually maybe one of the better ones from the layer Rapper Richard, what is this card? All right, we have the the bonus card, Hawkins National Laboratory, legendary land. Uh, tap to add a colorless four tap. Uh, investigate at the beginning of your end step. If you sacrifice three or more clues this turn, transform Hawkins National Laboratory. And the backside is the upside down. When this land transforms into the upside down, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. When the creature put onto the battlefield, uh, leaves the battlefield, transform the upside down, tap, pay one life to add a black. So it reanimates when it transforms. When your creature goes away, it transforms back. 
And the backside, you have to pay life to add black mana. So how good do you think this card is? I know it's like a flavor thing for Stranger Things, but as far as seeing play, like when I saw this card, my initial reaction was this has got to be one of the more playable cards from the Stranger Things secret layer drop. I mean, it is a little limited because the backside does make it a black card color identity wise. So you can't play in any deck, but still, I mean, a land that comes into play untapped, it can draw you cards. It's pretty expensive, going to be six mana altogether, but they can also flip around to reanimate stuff. Like how good is this in commander? Obviously, if you're playing like Eloise clues, it's going to be one of the best cards in your deck. But what about outside of like a dedicated clue commander? Is this something you can just run in your black deck? for value essentially i i don't see why not right like this seems like an amazing card and i'm not uh, like i i think this is just good like you don't have to build around it you don't it's not like you have to like do all that much to make this useful so i i guess the only thing here is like black does have a lot of utility lands but i mean this seems worth it right i think it's unplayable I mean <laughs> Well, really? okay, it needs to be okay. Dedicated clue deck. This thing is like crazy, right? So if you actually have clues, but if you don't, you need to activate this three times, and then you need to spend six mana to sack all the clues like in one shot for reanimation. Like, there's no way you're gonna use this for value. Like, you would be playing other cards in your value land slot. So you need to have a way to generate clues. And that needs to be the purpose of your deck. Otherwise, this is like Seth paying like 12 mana to draw a card. Like, this is <laughs> I, desperate I, times, right? You're, you're not only you investigating three times, you're not cracking them. You're saving them up, right? So you can crack them all together to, to transform this thing. I mean, that, maybe maybe that's why I like it, because I am willing to pay any amount of mana pretty much to draw a card if I have to. But what about like Arch of Araska? Arch of Araska, do you play Arch of Araska? It's what, five mana tap, draw a card. This is yeah. one more mana, but you get the upside of potentially reanimating stuff sometimes like i don't know is it is it that far away from being playable compared to arch of Araska? yeah like I, or do you just not play arch Ar <laughs> arch is, is a cut a but like there's a lot of these okay. like bonders enclave or whatever like there's a lot of these like desperation card draw uh spells and then you have like the good ones right the one where you pay life equal to your um you know, the colors like war room or something yeah yeah so i I don't know. I'd rather just play like a Vesuva a Thespian stage over this. I'd rather play a Maze of it. Like I'd literally rather play any utility land over this, right? I already have to cut those utility lands. We can't fit them all in our decks, even in uh, one or two color decks. So I, I don't think this is playable. Isn't, but isn't the fact that this could be, well, first off, it could be card draw. Yes. It also has some artifact stuff, but if you wanted it to, it could be a way to reanimate. And I feel like, that's better than, you know, like just a basic uh, Arch of Araska or something like that. I don't know. I, I would play Arch over this and Arch is already like a pretty questionable card. So I don't know. Would you guys play this over Arch? I 100. think I would play it over Arch of Araska, but I also don't play Arch of Araska that much. I think you're right. It's, it's one of those cards that I think about playing, but then it usually ends up just not quite making the cut. So I think I would play it over Arch, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make it into all my decks. You're also not desperate for card draw in black. That's the other thing, right? Like if this was a mono white card, like maybe you're feeling desperate, right? And you're willing to put this in, but you're you're in a black deck. Like you have plenty of ways to draw cards. You don't really need to be this sketchy about it. I think the biggest uh, downside of this card is clue decks are generally not black. Like Bant is probably the biggest clue colors. You got like Lanis and Simic. You got Denik and Azurius. But Eloise is really the only black clue commander. I do think where this card will be a staple though is with the Stranger Things commander because uh, those you have all the like pseudo partners. You're probably playing like 11, which gives you black and then you're adding in one of the other ones. Most of them in one way or another investigator make clue tokens. So I feel like if you're building around the Stranger Things commanders and you have black as one of your like friends forever color pairings, then I think this is going to be like one of the best cards in your deck. So it is really good. I think at powering up the Stranger Things commanders. I actually do like this card, though. Like, it feels Stranger Things-ish. You know, it has unique-looking mechanics. Like, we don't have cards that do this, right? So it actually feels worthy of being a Stranger Things secret layer card, unlike the other cards where I just rolled my eyes. <laughs>
We, we also got some good news about this card and more secret layer drop cards. So one of the concerns about this card in specific is Wizards has talked in the past about the difficulty of reprinting double face cards in various supplemental products. I guess they need like different printing sheets and it's like a big hassle. Well, Wizards confirmed that there will be a magic version of Hawking's National Laboratory along with the rest of the Stranger Things cards, but they even went a step further. They did something that we didn't think they were going to be able to do, which is they're printing magic versions of the Walking Dead cards as well. They just announced that last week. Uh, that was something that I think Wizards had said originally they didn't think was going to be possible, but apparently it is going to be possible. They didn't announce exactly when it's going to be happening, but they're going to be going on the list similar to the Stranger Things cards. How big of a deal do you think it is to, uh, to get magic versions of the Walking Dead cards alongside the Stranger Things cards? No more reason to complain. <laughs> right that, 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 that was the biggest knock against the walking dead uh now we have magic versions of the walking dead cards so uh i guess that's it right i guess they, they've solved it right unless you just want to complain about lore i guess that that's still there but you can play the magic cards so i don't know maybe this will quiet people down or maybe you'll find out that people are still very upset because it's walking dead so we'll, we'll see <laughs> yeah n now that that has been answered right like it's like that was my big issue with it which was distribution uh and whatnot but now that that's kind of like checked off i guess we'll still have to see how easy it is to actually acquire these cards or is it one of those things where like yes they are reprinted but you also have to buy this really obscure abstract booster pack or something like that right it, it comes in and the list maybe get it it comes in the because list. And then they also said, I don't know if they said for Walking Dead in particular, but the other secret layers, the other universes beyond, they said they're going to boost the, the drop rate in the list. So... Yeah, that, that was one of my concerns was the drop rate of the list because list cards are really scarce and the list is huge. But Wizards also announced that for the Stranger Thing cards, they're like not only increasing the drop rate, but massively increasing it. So every other list card that you get is going to be one of the reprints. So I, these cards should be very plentiful. Like I expect them actually to be like pretty cheap and super accessible. So I feel like I was nervous that they were going to be really hard to find. But after hearing what Wizard said about the Stranger Things cards, I think the list reprinting is actually oddly going to work out. And I'm pretty skeptical of the list being a reprint spot, but they're just going to print so many of them on the list that I think these cards are going to be all over the place. And that solves so many problems. Like it solves my accessibility issues, but it also solves some other players issues of just not liking Walking Dead or not liking Stranger Things and not wanting to play with those cards. Now I get the best of both worlds if you like Walking Dead. You can play with the Walking Dead cards. If you don't like Walking Dead for some reason, you can choose to play with the magic versions of the cards. So I feel like this is kind of the best we could have hoped for. I know some people probably still just wish that secret layer crossovers and universes beyond wasn't a thing, period. But if we grant that they're going to be happening, I feel like this is about as much as Wizards could have done to satisfy everyone's concerns. So I guess like good job from Wizards on this one, really. Does this mean that these cards are going to be like how the Godzilla cards were, but like reverse? Uh, I think it's more awkward than that. I My understanding is it's going to actually be two different cards and they're not going to have the like extra name on them or anything. So, uh, so there's going to be a magic version and the Walking Dead or Stranger Things version. But then the rules will say that you can only play a total of four copies of those cards. So so, yeah, I, I don't think they're going to look like the Godzilla cards, but that I think they're going to function. They're going to okay. function similarly to the Godzilla card. That part does feel weird that there's going to be two cards that are the same kind of, but have different names. But so work as like if they're the same card. So like in commander, I will be either a able to play Rick or I don't know. MTG magic Rick. Rick. Right. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, kind of weird, but all right, better than nothing. So <laughs> I think my concern with that would be would be just like new players not realizing this like somewhat obscure role and being like, hey, this card seems really good. It's just like Rick. This will be perfect for my Rick deck. Why wouldn't I play this? And I mean, I guess in Commander, it's not a huge deal. It's a casual format anyway. I don't think anyone's going to freak out too much if someone makes that mistake. Hopefully people just like nicely correct whoever makes a mistake. But I do think that's a thing that'll happen with uh, with newer players, because why wouldn't it happen? I If I was building a Rick deck and I didn't know better, I would want Magic in my deck too. 
Anyway, we got one other piece of news, which is uh, Wizards is creating a new play design team, a casual play design team that is focused on making casual products, which I think is mostly Commander. Uh, that'll probably be the biggest chunk of it. Although I'm sure it also entails other things, you know, weird conspiracy sets and things like that. So what do you think? What do you think about this new play design team? Uh, I I think this is interesting, um, but is this... Like, I, I, I guess I'd rather have them test something out for Commander because now that's like their go to format. But don't you, Seth, and like a few others, like, I feel like this is a, a common thing that I've heard. It's that people are concerned about the fact that magic is focused on Commander itself. Like, <laughs> the, the thing here is if that's the case and you feel that way about specifically Commander, this could be scary to you but for me i think this is a positive i think this yeah. will this will be fun like i i mean it's it's a good idea for right now i i guess it's like speaking in hypotheticals and i'm a little bit more of a glass half full kind of guy so i'll have to go with i am, am excited about this uh because this means now we won't have to worry about too many broken things going into commander because like you already know that magic is going to focus on commander and that that part is just you know we're gonna we ju you just have to move past that. However, the things that they can try to moderate the things that go into Commander as opposed to before it was just like a like blind whatever throw some darts and hope that it works out. Yeah, so I think I mean in my perfect uh, world of Commander. We just play with the cards that Wizards designs for standard or whatever, because that's kind of, I don't know, I think that's part of the fun of the format for me. So in general, I would prefer Commander not to have cards designed specifically for it. At the same time, I understand that that's not going to happen. Like, we're way past that. Commander is the biggest format. It's making a ton of money. It's super, super popular. So there's no way Wizards is not going to make cards for Commander. And if they are going to make cards for Commander, I definitely think it's better to have a play design team testing those cards than and not to have a play design team testing those cards. So even though I would prefer not to have commander specific cards at this point, I think uh, that's just that's in the past. That's done. We've moved past that. There are going to be commander cards and the more play testing, the better. The only thing I would say is I don't know if the track record of the, the actual play design team is super, super good because of the last couple years of broken cards and standards. So that makes me a little concerned is I'm just not exactly sure like. I don't, does having a play design team actually mean that we don't get broken cards? Because if it does, why do we get a play design team and then a million bannings in standard like the two years after that or something? So, so that part is a little bit concerning, but I think more testing of casual cards is good. Maybe we don't get as many jeweled lotuses or arcane signets because someone will catch that ahead of time because of this new team. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Seth. This is all non news. This is just marketing hype. Like we've had play design teams for standard, modern, and like look where that's gotten us. So, they're saying many things like uh, Melissa asked these questions like how likely is a card to show up? Is it fun if it shows up in high quantities? How much fun is this for the table? Like net fun? You know, how easy or difficult is it uh, to include in your deck? Does this card have enough interaction points and counterplay? You know, these all sound like reasonable questions, but, you know, is standard balanced is also a reasonable question and they're not able to hit it. So this is just more of the same news from them. I'm not actually excited about this like they're gonna have a small team try to dictate the play experience for millions of players right I, I, i'd rather them see you know have an announcement about like using some new way to calculate stats or ai or something about getting like actual real player feedback and putting it back in the loop uh but you know this is the way they've gone and we've seen how it works with standard uh we've seen how they're modern focus has worked out right we've seen how their year of commander commander focus has worked out so i'm not sure this means anything other than you know we're spending more effort on commander but i don't expect commander to get better or worse from this news it's just like wizards gonna keep doing wizards things well let's move on and talk about our big topic for the day which is modern and i think this topic is super interesting to me so obviously we just got what three months ago four months ago modern horizons 2 our second modern horizon set and the first modern horizon set it came along and it definitely made an impact. There were certainly a few broken cards like Hogak that had a huge impact but ended up being banned. But overall, I think Modern Horizons 1 
mostly other than those couple of like misses that were just way too good powered up a lot of tier three decks and like made them tier two decks or powered up some like tier you know two decks and made them tier 1.5 decks but it didn't just come in and absolutely change the whole modern meta especially once we got rid of those those mistake cards like hogak modern horizons 2 has had a much bigger impact, I think, than Modern Horizons 1. Over on MGDGoldfish.com, you can look at the most played cards by format, format staples. If you go to Modern right now, the top creatures in Modern, we have Loris, we have Stoneforge Mystic, we have Brazen Borrower, and then the other seven cards are all Modern Horizons 2 cards. Endurance, Solitude, Sanctifier and Beck, Ragavan, Fury, Dragon Rage Channeler, and Esper Sentinel. And even the spells, not as heavy as creatures, but Prismatic Ending is on there. We have a couple of OG Modern Horizons cards in Force of Negation, Force of Vigor. We got Counterspell, which entered the format because of Modern Horizons 2. So really, at this point, Modern Horizons 2 uh, or modern is essentially a modern horizons 2 format if you just look at the most played decks in the format nearly all of them are playing modern horizons 2 cards and many of them are built around modern horizons 2 cards i know even your beloved john richard is it's like a loris dragon rage channeler deck now that's like the threats that you play in your john deck what do you guys think about where modern is right now in the impact that modern horizons 2 has had on the format i you know what I like personally, my opinions on the format is that modern is still oddly like it, it's got a whole shakeup from modern horizons too, but it's still very fun. Uh, I don't, I don't know how that is when I like when the format is at a point where I have to chalice of the void main deck. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like <laughs> the, the thing it, like control has now like dropped path because it's a one drop and I'm just going to play solitude instead. And like, this is, this is a weird timeline where I just like look at a, de a card like Path to Exile and that's not getting played, but it's, it's still, it, it's oddly fun to me. And Monkey though, like spirals out of control real quick. I think it's still like, it, it, it's a format shakeup that I think is okay with me. Maybe that's just the way I feel right now because, you know, I, you know, like I, whatever, I'm still enjoying it, but maybe in a, a year I won't feel so great about all the free spells and all the stuff and all like the, I don't know, the monkey like drama stuff. So I, I, I like it. And some of these cards, like the reprints, I think should have already been in the format. Uh, I think I've talked about like how counter spells should have existed years ago in modern. Um, and, and like e even now to this day, yes, counter spells a very good card, but is this the end of modern? No. Like, like there, there are many things that have quote unquote ended modern, like Jace the Mind Sculptor, but like Counterspell was just another one of them. Yeah, I don't think anyone cares about think, Counterspell. Richard? I think, <laughs> I yeah. think it's the monkey, right? And this is right. not just a modern problem. Like Vintage and Legacy, uh, also have been heavily warped, and everyone's just playing monkey decks, right? And yes, there's a variety of different decks you can play, but the the problem for me is monkey is not fun to play against, right? Like you need to mull down to removal to deal with the monkey. And like, there's no catching up if you didn't kill the monkey on turn one when you had the chance to kill it, right? And if you kill it like two or three turns later, they've gotten so much value off of it, like your game is over. So I, I dislike that. I dislike that Modern is a rotating format now. It's like, okay, when Modern Horizons 3 comes out, throw out your monkey decks, right? It's going to be whatever they're printing there. Um, like re if you recall correctly, right? If you recall Modern Horizons, the original, like... It was run in six Fiesta, right? And then now it's Ragavan, right? And we're just playing really expensive standard at this point, uh, which I feel is problematic. And I don't know how they would solve it because they're not going to make a modern Horizons that doesn't sell well. Like, why would they do that, right? Which means the cards they print need to see substantial play in modern, which means it's going to warp the modern meta. And that just means modern is now like standard two right like it's just a rotating <laughs> format like buckle up like get 500 to a thousand dollars ready every time a modern horizons set comes out because you need to buy all the support cards for your new deck as well right so that's where we are the format itself is okay but i just don't like how it's so expensive and it rotates like this like it's it's happening right like the fact that vintage and legacy like literally look different like they just change all together every time a modern horizons comes out is like problematic yeah, I think the price is, uh, that's a really good point. And that's something I'm concerned about too. I think rotation kind of works for standard because in general, standard decks are 
relatively inexpensive. Like if you play standard decks, uh, you know, they're a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, sometimes worst case, maybe three or 400 bucks. In modern, you got a lot of decks that are 800 bucks, a thousand bucks, 1500 bucks, $2,000 isn't out of the question for the most expensive decks in the format. Uh, and that's tough if it's rotating every year or two. That's a, that's a big chunk of value to potentially lose. Of course, hopefully not all your cards are going to lose value. Like Ren and Six is still an expensive and playable card, even though it might not be what it was when Modern Horizons, uh, the original first released. But I do think that is a big concern. I think Modern is in a, in an interesting place. I like the format and I still very much enjoy playing Modern. So it's not that modern has become unfun for me at all. I do think that maybe this modern horizons was a little bit too much change for the format. I think that modern in the past before modern horizons changed too little. I remember the, the days of having a set release video and trying to do the top 10 cards for modern and literally scraping around for maybe a card that could show up in a sideboard sometime. And that was the top 10 list because modern just wouldn't change at all because it was so powerful. New standard cards couldn't really break into it, but we've gotten a lot more powerful standard cards that have shown up in modern plus we're getting modern horizons and now we're going through a huge shakeup every year or two which i think maybe we need a little bit more uh, middle ground here maybe we'd be better off if modern horizons changed uh modern but didn't just completely make a brand new meta so i do think i still love modern horizons and modern horizons too it's still one of my favorite products and i want them to keep printing them for sure but i do think that maybe maybe the second one went a little bit too far with the shakeup it is pretty jarring to think that in modern, a format that's been around for decades and features 20 years uh, worth of magic cards in the card pool, that you have to play cards uh, essentially from the most recent modern horizon set to be competitive. And I think that's kind of where we're at at this point. And I'm not sure that that aspect is really good. I think part of what people enjoyed about modern was the idea that I could work towards building this expensive deck, but it's going to be worth it because I can play that expensive deck for a long time. I think, as I said, in the past, maybe it was too long of a time, but now it might be too short of a time that you, uh, you get out of your investment before the next big shakeup comes. And I do want to point out that we've forgotten about Modern Horizons 1, right? Like Hogak, Urza, those were the good cards, right? They're they're gone, right? Monkey is still here. Monkey could go, right? But Monkey is like a fair card, right? The other cards were more like combo-y. Uh, but, you know, like... Monkey is a fair card. I like it when you say it. It say is, it again. right? You don't, you don't die <laughs> yeah, instantly, yeah. right? You, you think you're playing yeah, a game yeah. of magic and it keeps going for a while, right? And then everyone's like, oh, your deck can't handle a one drop? Please get good, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy to like argue down Monkey, right? But Monkey is here and we already powered it down, right? Like, So I, I don't know. Like, Maybe the problem is just you bad Monkey and then... We just complain about free solitude and endurances, and that's better, right? But, you know, Modern Horizons 1 really got their big hitters, like, all out of the format. They're all banned. If, okay, a I question then. Do you think if those didn't get banned, right, and we somehow were all just a glutton for pain, and we loved playing Hogak, right? To the And if it were still legal when 2 came out, would 2 cards even get played? Or do you think Hogak would still <laughs> take over? I, I, I like Hogak because it was, like, one deck. Right or no like, way? You, know, like, <laughs> you liked decks. Hogak? <laughs> no, no, no. But you know what I mean? Like, yeah, the deck was overpowered, but it didn't bleed into like every like every fair deck plays monkey, right? Like that's the problem. Like if there's only one monkey deck and it was good, I would have less issue than that. Than like monkey just goes in like every single like like playing control. Just put four monkeys in. It's probably better, right? Like playing tempo <laughs> four monkeys. Obviously <laughs> playing mid range jun four monkeys. Like, I don't like that part of it, right? Where Hogak was like a single deck. I mean, maybe you just hit enough bridges and stuff like that and keep Hogak around if you want. Uh, they tried that, by the way. It didn't work. But, you know, like same with Eldrazi, right? When Eldrazi came to Modern, it was a single deck. Maybe it was too good, but it's a single deck, right? <laughs> Not maybe in, like, it was too <laughs> every single deck has like Eldrazi in it now, right? Like that's the problem with some of these staples they're printing. And I, I think that it makes it harder to fix if you do get to the point where you want to fix it. Because if the Hogak 
deck is too good. You just ban the Hagak deck. But when something like uh, the Monkey is too good, it's in so many decks. It's not like you can just take this one deck out of the meta. They even tried that with Hagak banning like Bridge from Below to keep the Hagak in the format. It didn't end up working out. But it's much easier, I think, to target. As, as far as I can see, there's a couple of big differences between the first Modern Horizons and second uh, Modern Horizons that maybe will be good lessons as we eventually, I'm sure, get a third Modern Horizons. What I see as a big difference is the best cards from Modern Horizons 2 are primarily one drops or even free lands in the case of Urza Saga. But you got like Dragon Rage Channeler, you got the Monkey, then you got the land uh, in Urza Saga. Those free or cheap cards are the most powerful cards in the set. If you look at the original Modern Horizons, there were still some really powerful cards that still have a huge impact on Modern, but a lot of them were in like the three to four mana range. You're looking at like Season Pyromancer, you're looking at Yagma. You're looking at, uh, uh, I guess, Renin 6 is two mana, but the, the best cards were a little bit more expensive. Ranger, Captain of Eos, the big chase mythics of the set were kind of these mid-rangey threats that did see a ton of play in modern, but they weren't the one drop that every single deck is going to play. I think the other difference is with the free spells. We obviously had a cycle of free spells in the first Modern Horizons, the fourth cycle. Those cards see a decent amount of play, especially the, the good ones. Force of Negation, uh, the green one also sees a decent amount of play, but those are just spells. Part of what makes the free spell cycle for Modern Horizons 2, the evoke elemental cycle, so strong is how it's abusable with the evoke mechanic. Uh, we see, I think those are fine, fair cards, but we see a lot of decks that are looking to specifically abuse them by blinking them with ephemerate, for example, or doing uh, brought back other shenanigans like that, that kind of turn them from a free spell into this free spell that's also a pretty powerful permanent that sticks on the battlefield. So I feel like those are maybe the two big differences between the set that just pushed Modern Horizons 2 to such a huge, huge heights compared to Modern Horizon 1 and may have such a huge impact on the format. So do you think there's, is there, a, is there a middle ground we could get to where maybe Modern Horizons 1 was maybe too weak, let's say. Modern Horizons 2, is it too good? Is there any chance that Modern Horizons 3 kind of strikes the right balance? Or do you think we should just expect when Modern Horizon 3 comes out, you know, as Richard said, throw out your monkeys because there's going to be something that is just better than the monkey that Wizards prints. I mean, the, it's a tough line to walk, right? Because you have to make cards that want to get played in Modern. And I, I don't know. I mean, like, that that is a very hard task to do. So it's easier to make sure that's the case if you lean towards powerful cards. So I think it's going to be probably along the lines of, I don't know if monkeys getting thrown out as that. I, I guess I'm scared at the idea of what would be better than monkey, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it would move in the direction of that, right? Like, uh, may maybe a good amount of modern horizons one and like part of horizons two gets phased out because of how good three is. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I think it's going to be powerful, right? Like all the cards set listed are one to two, like zero to two CMC effectively, right? Like Hogak was really a two drop. Urza was really like free because you could tap all your artifacts for mana. Then you have the literal free spell cycles. Monkey is one. If you print a good three or four CMC card that's actually like three or four CMC, it's not going to be played. Like most decks won't play it. So for them to sell their product, they need to print kind of these cards. So I expect Monkey to be replaced, right? Uh, you know, maybe they create a more powerful storm card or something such that monkey is too fair. Like you can't get anything done with monkey, <laughs> right? Or they make like, you know, like in uh, in Legacy, they play Merktite Regent, also MH2, right? As like a Delver-esque card, right? Like they can make a flying monkey or something like that, right? So, you know, I, I do think they're going to push, push the envelope, right? Like this is how powerful modern is. For Modern Horizons 3 to sell, it needs to be even more powerful. So whatever that means, right? So it can't go back. They can't make it worse. Then who's going to buy the cards, right? So we got to see power creep to sell more cards. Yeah, that and that is kind of a scary thought because it is hard to imagine a one drop that is better than Ragavan. Like, Ragavan is just so incredibly good at what it does. Do you think we, we need banning? Should we be talking about bannings? Like, on one hand... 
it is a diverse format. Like, I think, according to the metagame page, Hammer Time is the number one deck, and it's like 10% of the meta. There's a ton of different decks. If you play a Modern League, you often play against, you know, four or five different decks. So the metagame is still diverse as far as archetypes are concerned. But within those archetypes, you have these, like, meta archetypes, where you got Ragavan decks, you have Urza Saga decks, you have the Cascade-style decks. And between those three, like, meta archetypes, that actually accounts for a huge percentage especially if you throw Lurus in there as another meta archetype like those four meta archetypes really encompass a huge percentage of the modern meta game so do you think we should be having conversations about banning monkey or before we were talking about Urza Saga being on that level and I think monkey is kind of like taken most of the heat at this point and Urza Saga I haven't seen talked about as much but do you think uh, it's time to have a conversation about whether modern needs to change or do we just wait until the next you know modern rise since that comes along and trust that that's going to change the meta for us uh okay nothing's changed for me i still think urza saga is a dumb card i think that card <laughs> should be banned so <laughs> it the people may have shifted their eyes to monkey but i have kept my eye on the main problem <laughs> <laughs> All right. I haven't been waned by this. I hate Urza Saga. I think it's a dumb card. It, it actually, I've got, I've grown angrier at the card every time. But is it time for bannings? Yes, for Urza Saga. Everything else, I think, is fine. I legitimately, everything else just hasn't felt problematic. Yes, there are lots of monkeys, but. That's not necessarily like the end of the format, right? Like I don't think it's that all that bad either. And you know, like. Sure, it, it requires you to have more removal, but that's great because then that means like those unfair decks, right, are have to work a little harder to beat Monkey. I feel like, Krim, you you really base your evaluations based on what your control decks can deal with. No, I don't <laughs> just I play. Push deal, <laughs> deal with this card. If so, it's fine. If not, I, it's okay, Urza Saga. okay. I can see why you would think that. And yes, that is a fair <laughs> assessment. But I legitimately think. That, that Saga is a very powerful card, and the fact that it is a land, right? Like, yes, technically, I can't, control decks can't beat Field of the Dead, but is that card not strong? I I think... Oh, it is, it's strong. I definitely agree with you, Urza Saga is very strong. Right, so, like, but, like, Monkey and all of that, like, if anything, that pressures now all the unfair decks, right, to, like, also have removal. So they have to slightly either, A, go faster, or, which, you know, which is a possibility with Modern Horizons 3, or, you know, dilute their deck and play a little bit more removal. And I think that's fine, right? I uh, I kind of want bannings. Like, I kind of feel what? like we're almost in the, in the Hogak situation again, where... Most of the set is fine. I actually kind of like the Evoke Elementals. I almost wish they had split second or something so you couldn't pull off the shenanigans with them. And then I think I would love them because I do think some of the shenanigans with blinking them can be uh, maybe like pushing it as far as power level is concerned. But really, I kind of feel like if you chopped Raghavan out of uh, modern and you chopped Urza Saga out of modern, then I feel like most of the rest of the set is sweet. Like, Murktide Regent is a cool card. Esper Sentinel, like, that shows up a lot, but it doesn't bother me. Having Archon of Cruelty as a new reanimation target, or Cauldra Complete, like, sometimes it gets you on turn three off of Stoneforge, but whatever, like, that's still, like, fine, and Grist is cool, and Ignoble Hierarch is cool. So I almost feel it's like these couple of cards at the top end of the format that are really, really dominating the meta right now, and I think I would just be in favor of getting rid of them, even if Raga is not like uh, making one deck overpowered it just shows up in so many different decks i mean you see human decks splashing it as a non-human creature just because it's that good like that's a pretty good sign that the card is pretty busted when your tribal decks are playing off drive one drop just because it's that powerful as a standalone card so i, I mean, think i would support getting rid of saga and ragavan and then i think the rest of the set might just be fine I could totally see why, right? Like, you know, like, yeah, like, Monkey would definitely... <laughs> yeah, there's no way you're not going to see Monkey, right? As of right now in this standard. So I, I, I could see what you're, you're, you're getting at there. I, I mean, like, I just recently uh, did a video, right, playing Mo Mono Red Eldrazi, <laughs> Be playing the Honorary Eldrazi, also known as Rockabon. <laughs> <laughs> What do, what do you think about all this, Richard? Do we need bannings? I don't know what you would ban at this point, like... Or is the, the problem is just like the like we talked about this before, like the direction that Wizards has taken these cards, right? Like you know, outside of mid range mirrors and stuff, like like Monkey's not that big of a problem, right? Like 
if you're just hammer timing someone, yeah, maybe they take one of your hammers, right? Maybe they ramp a turn. Like, you, you know, you are one turn slower because your opponent is one turn faster with the monkey, right? But, you know, the, the real annoying part is, like, when you try to play mid-range matches and they play monkey and then they win by playing a monkey and doing nothing. Like, that's very annoying. Like, it doesn't feel rewarding. It doesn't feel like your opponent outplayed you. You know, at least, like, when they storm off, they're like, oh, good sequence there. You know, you played around everything. You stormed <laughs> off. You played eight cards. You know your deck well. Good job, right? Where they play monkey, they get a man advantage, they destroy you, and you're like, what did you even do? I feel like I got ripped off here, right? So I feel it's more of that play pattern as opposed to anything else. So I, I don't know, like metagame percentage wise, like the metagame is pretty healthy, right? Like it's not like monkey is totally dominating like Hogak, but it's just an annoying card and it, it doesn't feel like we're playing magic. It feels like someone just won the, the die roll and, and won the game, right? So that's my biggest problem, like the play pattern of the card. So so let me ask Man. you this. What is the justification for having Deathrite Shaman banned if Ragavan is legal? Is Deathrite even better than... I don't think it is. If you look at Legacy where they're both legal, like Ragavan is definitely way ahead of Deathrite Shaman in terms of decks playing it. Like, if the power level is going to be Modern Horizons 2 level, a uh, power level, should we be having conversations about unbanning some cards? No. Like, maybe some of these <laughs> cards that were too good five years ago are actually just perfectly fine or maybe even not very good anymore compared to the power level of Modern Horizons cards. Oh, dude, dude. <laughs> Death Rite is so good. <laughs> Death Rite is so good. Is it? I, don't, I, you, I think Death Rite is Would you not just play good. a monkey deck? Like, what would you do with Death Rite? Would you put them... The you would go is, Jund. You put them both in the same deck and like, yeah. go to town, right? But if you had to choose one or the other, wouldn't you just choose monkey? It, it, wait, I, I would rather, yes, I would rather monkey be in the format, correct? But, uh, but I feel if like monkey is more powerful. De I Death feel like is more busted. powerful. It is busted. It is busted it, I mean, in Death long, Rite grindy matches, card, right? But. Where, but like, we're not long, grindy matching anyone in modern, right? So, hmm. I think it's close. But I do think that is a conversation. And I, I don't think it would be that broken. Like, I think at best it would just be monkey level broken but at worst it'd like not even see play like just poor jun players are playing it it's not just yeah. jun though like any green deck would play it any black deck would play it you know and and like i think i think the ability to ramp and to all like I, i'm happy that it's it's able to like you know dunk on decks that rely on the graveyard but like the, the ramping and all of that like oh boy <laughs> that's pretty major because that, that's pretty yeah. much what monkey kind of does if it connects, right? Yeah, that's that's true. But you can dash it in, and it just snowballs. Mon monkey's so a hard threat. Like you can delve with advantage. it, right? Which is the difference between death right and like monkey. Like monkey is if you just protect the monkey, you ride it to victory. Whereas death right is like you ramp, and then it's somehow like a late game win con. But you need to get to late game, right? It's interesting. It's an interesting <sighs> question. I, I wonder. And what would you do? Like, maybe you just play monkey death right decks, right? And then you just go crazy, <laughs> right? Like, maybe that's the answer, right? But, I mean, I think I think Wizards is due for a busted mana dork, right? Like, Modern Horizons 3. Maybe not death right shaman. Maybe an upgraded one or maybe a slightly nerfed one. But I, I think they're due to make another one, no? Yeah, I mean, I think it is. I mean, we got Ignoble High Arc. That's kind of like the top tier, I would say, of Mana Dorks at this point, but it has, definitely has not dominated the format. It shows up in some decks. I think we could see, even if we don't get literal Deathlight Shaman unbanned, maybe we get to see something that's like almost Deathrite Shaman or something on that level. But it wouldn't surprise me. Like, I, I'm not sure Wizards can make a, a literal Ragavan that's better than Ragavan. Can you make a, a red one drop that's better than that? I'm not sure that you actually can, but you could certainly make a, a upgraded Noble High Arc or some other sort of Mana Dork that would be better than the other options and sell a lot of packs. So maybe that is the the direction they head, a, a head next time they print a Modern Horizon. Well, the good news is it sounds like we're all still enjoying modern, which I think is the most important thing. We play magic because it's fun. And even though the meta is very monkey heavy and modern horizons has certainly made the format more expensive and shaken things up to a huge, huge extent, uh, at least we're all still having fun playing it, which uh, that's a good thing. At least it's not like any of us are quitting modern. We've certainly had way 
worst times in modern i don't even know if i'd consider this a bad time in modern it's just a really weird and different time in modern where we have one set that's really dominating the format that's not something we've ever i don't think seen before in a format as big as modern we're used to it in standard where the new set comes out or there's a rotation and then all of a sudden you got thrown a valderay and you got called uh kaladesh or whatever that it just kind of dominates the meta we're kind of seeing modern horizons 2 doing that in modern which is just it's unique it's something we've never really experienced before in the format but at least it's still fun so i think that's a that's a good thing yeah like anyway. I, I i think like the okay. fact that monkey and all these other fair cards outside of versus saga uh being uh in the format is fine like this is this is a blast i'm having the time of my life playing modern anyway any other uh modern thoughts before we answer some fish mail all right richard take it away all right if you have questions send them to at mtg goldfish with the hashtag mtg fish mail we'll get to your questions on air uh rooked W. Elodin, given your reaction to white draw being limited 1x per turn, I'm surprised by the MTG Goldfish Commander's podcast reaction to see Esper Sentinel. What do you think about the 1x per turn restriction in the context of Esper Sentinel? Ooh, so I feel like Esper Sentinel compared to some of the other things we've seen is likely to trigger on each of your opponent's turn something like mentor the meek where you have to have a creature coming to play on you uh, which is very difficult to do during your opponent's turn you can theoretically make a token instant speed or something but really in general you play creatures during your turn mostly limits it to once each turn cycle i think esper sentinel for me gets a bit of a pass because it's likely going to trigger on each of your opponent's turn much of the time and if it is triggering on each of your opponent's turn that's actually a of card advantage like that's up to four cards a turn so i think that's how you have to kind of weigh it if this is a card that's only triggering once each turn cycle i don't think that's very impactful if it's potentially triggering once on each player's turn so four times a turn cycle then that is enough card advantage that i think it can actually be a, a pretty powerful card even with the once per turn restriction all right cashman james do you think extra turn spells if extra if extra turn spells had more of a downside, uh, let's say Alrin's Epiphany gives your opponents the birds, it would be a f more fair or better play pattern. Specifically yes. in, in that one, yes, that would be like Alrin's Epiphany. And I, I, I think extra turn spells should always be attached with something a lot like the red ones where you lose the game the next turn or something like that. I, I think, yeah, like maybe if you stasis yourself, like maybe your mana produces half the mana on your follow up turn. Uh, so that you're using it for extra combats or extra activations and not the full blown extra turn. Or what if what if you give your opponents back the turns they lose? Like, like how Emrakul was? Like Emrakul, yeah. Like if you took five extra turns and somehow didn't end the game, <laughs> your opponent's getting five extra turns in a row right after you. Like, does that work oh. or help? I feel like Me? extra turn, like if it's giving the turn back, I don't think that's enough because usually you're not getting your turn back. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will say, though, it should be something like I, I would love to see that, you know, maybe like, oh, your permanents don't untap this turn. Right. Or uh, like or on the next turn. And then like that might help a little bit. Or if it's like lose the game the next turn. I mean, we we already have some of those things like uh, uh, we have. Oh, what is what is a blue one? That's three men in modern that literally doesn't let you untap during your turn. Like that's You're talking about we do have that drawback. Reckoning? Uh, no, there's a blue extra turn spell. Savor, oh, savor the oh. moment. Savor yeah, the moment. Yeah, yeah. Three mana extra turn. You skip your untap step. Like stuff like that, I think. Three mana might be a little aggressive for standard, but still, I think those kind of drawbacks are pretty interesting. I don't know if just like the birds would make uh, giving the birds to your opponent would make Alrin's Epiphany a bit fairer, but I, I don't know if that's enough of a drawback. If we're going to keep doing extra turn spells, I would prefer a harsher drawback than give your opponent a couple of one ones. Although I guess like at least that lets you chump the gold span dragon or whatever, and it might help you survive the turn, but I'm still not sure that would be super enjoyable. I do think it's tough though, because the, the line between like broken and unplayable with extra turn spells seems to be pretty narrow. Like some extra turn spells just aren't good enough to really do anything. Karn's temporal sundering, for example, had the drawback of needing to have a legend on the battlefield. Didn't really see much play at all. There are a couple of like weird 
bruise on occasion, but really it wasn't anywhere near a staple level card. So if you have too harsh of a drawback, they're basically unplayable and maybe that's just fine. Uh, but I think it is a, a really tricky effect to design for to make it not so powerful that you're nexusing or Alrun's epiphanying, but also good enough that people will actually play them in their competitive decks. Yeah, I, I think Magic players are smart. So if they get around the downside, then there is no downside and this card is busted. Otherwise, the downside, the downside is so great, they just don't play the card, right? So it's like dredge, right? Either it's unplayable or it's like completely busted, like choose one. So I think it's going to be pretty hard. Whatever downside they come up with uh, will either make it unplayable or people will find a way around it and it's not a downside whatsoever. Uh... Tandy Pastel, what's with all the hate for limited and draft? On the fly strategic building, no cookie cutter meta and limited resources. It seems like it takes more wits than Googling a deck and slamming epiphanies, but people don't like it. Oh, you know, I, as somebody who pretty much never plays limited, it just doesn't seem fun either for me. Uh, I like I like the idea. I think Limited has lots of things that you need as a Magic player. Like, it's very good for you, right? To, like, play Limited, it helps you with deck building. Uh, and much like mentioned, there's no one specific, like, you know, meta other than, like, maybe some formats people are like, oh, well, whatever, just draft every cycling thing and then use Zenith Flare, right? But outside of that, for the most part, Limited is actually pretty diverse when it comes to the decks you'll play against and things like that. So I don't know, actually. For me, it's just... I don't find it interesting for me limited i enjoy limited quite a bit uh the th thing for me is though i mostly do constructed content so that's the main thing that keeps me from playing more limited uh from a more broad perspective though i think part of the issue is the price uh limited in general I, I guess everywhere, even in paper, like it costs money. If you want to go do a draft at your local game store, you got to pay for the packs. If you want to do a draft on Arena, you have to pay so many gems or Magic Online. You got to pay so many tickets. So unlike Constructed, where you can just build a deck and then you can go on the ladder and you can grind it for 20 hours a day if you want to without putting in any extra money. Limited, you got to keep investing and investing and investing. And that's fine if you are really good at Limited. If you're good enough at Limited that you go infinite and it's paying for itself, that's not really a concern. But for a lot a lot of players it is a really big expense and if you go to like the arena subreddit you'll hear people talking about like trying to save up their gold for the week so they can do a draft or whatever so i think that is one of the one of the pinches for uh, the restrictions that keeps limited from getting bigger is it's just inherently a more expensive format for players that aren't really good at it yeah i, I play a lot of limited i love limited i just don't like watching limited uh when i'm not playing limited so like for pro tours and things like that like it's a little boring to watch if you're not actually invested in the format um, but I, I do think like the no meta thing is like over played like there is definitely a meta right yes you can draft and like not know what you're doing and still do well but just like you can take a look at some standard cards put together some reasonable looking mid-range deck and go right like there's definitely a meta for each uh limited format uh, you may not follow it you can just use like the the the, uh, what was it? Bread? I don't even remember anymore. Bombs, removal, <laughs> evasion. Yeah, yeah. Evasion. I don't know what A is. I don't know what A and D are, are, but yeah. Like just, <laughs> just draft bombs, right? But you could use that, but there is definitely a meta, right? And I think the scariest thing is actually going into a blind meta and then doing draft. Because if you play against someone who knows what they're doing, like you cannot win, right? Like no, they know what the good color pairs are. They know what the synergistic pairs are. They can plan ahead. Uh, but... Um, it's good if you don't have a collection, right? Like to play limited is like 10 bucks, 15 bucks or whatever. To play standard is like 100 upfront, right? So it's good if you just want to get a taste of the game. Uh, but I think it's just, I don't know. I don't know why people don't like limited as much. Uh, it, it seems to fall by the wayside for wizards uh, for the competitive play. And I think it's just hard to follow, I think. I think there's it's hard to build a narrative around like random collection of cards versus like, oh, it's an epiphany deck. Right. It's very easy to explain to someone that. So 
Uh, next question. Aloha, mage. Is galvanic iteration a bigger problem than epiphany? And if epiphany is banned, how long until iteration enables another card to be abusive? Tasha's hideous laughter. Go. Actually, I like I like galvanic iteration. I think it's actually like a pretty sweet card. I think the problem is extra turn spells. Although I do think that even if they did ban Elrond's epiphany, that uh, that we'd still see iteration sync play, and it, it would still do something. I don't think it would be broken, but I think the flashback ability on it is a really huge huge deal compared to past versions that just really haven't been good enough for constructed but i think it would be a a powerful but fine card without extra turn spells to copy uh 11 vicious if they removed flash from hull breacher would it make it more fair and unban worthy uh mm. funny enough i actually had this discussion and i think uh, that I, I think this is definitely unbannable if you don't have flash it's not no longer a gotcha you, you see it coming from a mile away um but yeah, I think Flash is what makes it pretty big. And then, I mean, the treasures, like, I, I think if you could just take something off of uh, Hall Breacher, it'll be unbannable. Yeah, that that might be fine. I still dislike the the wheel play pattern, like Narset is a sorcery version, which I don't think is bannable, but uh, I still find very obnoxious just because because of the wheel play pattern. But discounting the wheel thing, I think Hall Breacher without Flash would probably be would probably be super fine. I don't even know if it would be very good, honestly, if it didn't have Flash and people could see it coming. Like Narset, you can kind of get away with it because it can trips, but with its negative ability and it's a planeswalker, so it's not going to die to a sword supply shares or whatever. I don't even know if Sorcery Speed Hall Breacher would... Uh, be that good honestly outside of the wheel combos all right uh next question young frenchy 313 uh sent us a picture from the top of mount marcy uh that they Ooh. climbed uh what will wizards give us popper horizons uh, more seriously with the prices in magic skyrocketing do you think there will ever be a shift to popper for cheap competitive magic <sighs> Popper has its own its own set of issues. It it seems like speaking of everything we talked about with Modern Horizons in uh, in Modern, in a lot of ways it's double that in Popper, where we get these Modern Horizons set that gives us things like Peregrine Drake in, entering the format as a common, or maybe that was a master set. Actually, we got Chatterstorm with our most recent Modern Horizon. So Popper arguably it gets a hogak every time we get a master set or some sort of uh, Modern Horizon style set. So I think that is kind of the issue. And part of the problem is Wizards just doesn't seem to care that much. So it takes a really long time when you'll hear tons of Popper players like one wanting a ban and wanting a ban and it takes like three or six more months for the ban to actually come through that everyone's asking for so i think it would have to be managed uh a lot more consistently than it is now for it to really take off as a format i think the other thing is I don't know if it's a format for everyone. Like, I enjoy Popper, but it is a super grindy format. And some of the things that you associate with constructed magic, like the ability to wrath away your opponent's board or something, just doesn't exist because wrath effects don't exist at common. So I don't know if Popper could ever be a, a GP style format. I don't know if it could ever be, you know, a, a modern or even what Pioneer was at its peak, where you're going to have thousands of people. But I do think that Wizards could definitely do more with it. I think printing products for it, though, is super hard because common are cheap and wizards wants to make money i don't know like how would you how do you print a proper's master set when all the cards in the format are so cheap like who how do you get people to buy a, a seven dollar booster pack or whatever of of all commons like is there even a way you could possibly do that so that might be the other problem is it's not an easy format for wizards to monetize compared to commander or compared to modern or formats like that where you have these hundred dollar cards that you can reprint to get people to buy boxes because popper is so cheap maybe that's actually it's undoing because it's going to keep wizards from really fully supporting it because they feel like they can't monetize it effectively introducing the mythic common uh <laughs> I, I don't know what they're gonna do right like yeah it's gonna be a special like if you if you're gonna sell a three dollar booster pack right even just like a normal uh a normal set of popper cards guess what like there's a popper card worth 20 30 dollars like do you really want that to your format I, I don't know so i think you kind of just want wizards to ignore popper and just print good cards and let the popper format sort itself out um i know you know before the original modern horizons and commander legends and things like that right people were like yeah we need wizards to make like dedicated products right and then cue the endless complaining afterwards right so i i, I don't know right like when wizard starts printing for your format they will shape it to what they think is correct right which most likely is not what the community currently thinks it is so um 
there, there's pros and cons, right? You get new cards, but then also you get this like totally different format. So I, I don't know if you really want that. And Wizards needs to make money. Uh, they're not going to make like 50 cent boosters for you. So I, I don't know how we would solve that part either. Maybe maybe they just take a bunch of mythics and rares and put a common symbol on them and sell the packs. Can you imagine like Raghavan, the common version, so it's legal and pop popper? No, it has to be unstable. <laughs> also, unstable. Like all the lands are now fetch lands and shock lands. And then the rest of the pack is commons, right? And then there's like box stoppers or something, right? Like basically what they do to sell the, the silver bordered cards. Yeah, that could work. If you had like unique fetch lands or something in a special slot, that that would probably sell the product. All right. So thank you to everyone who sent in questions this week. If you have questions, send them to at MTG Goldfish with the hashtag MTG Fish Mail. And we'll get to your questions on air. And I believe that brings us to the end of episode 352 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So Richard Krim, thanks for hanging out. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And we will be back next week to talk about, well, definitely spoilers, because that's starting on Thursday oh, for yeah. Innistrad Crimson Vow and whatever else goes on in the world of magic. So until then, everyone, have a great week. And this is a crew signing out.